So this is lecture 33, and I'm going to show you a cartoon from the New York Times uh, Week in Review, and I'm going to spend all my time just talking about this cartoon. It's funny, but uh, it's informative, and I think economists have some insights, and it comes back to some themes in my Climatopolis book that perhaps not everyone remembers. So every Sunday, the New York Times has its intellectual Week in Review section. I don't know who actually reads it, and I just want to show you this cartoon. And let's play it straight. So, reading from left to right. The rich and poor victims of climate change. And this is going to be sort of a 1% versus 99%. So on the left, we got the fat cat uh, who says, because of climate change, I'd go to Canada to ski on their socialist slopes, no less. And on the right side is the 99%er. I had to move to my roof to breathe as the storm of the century leads to flooding and he heads to higher ground. In the right side of the upper panel we see the fat cat realizing that there's no caviar. What? The habitat of caviar sturgeon has been destroyed? And on the right side we got a poor 99 percenter taking a bite out of a rock which he has relabeled a desert potato. And then in the lower left side, we've got the fat cat uh, being forced due to climate change to re and uh, carbon regulation to reshuffle his portfolio. I had to transfer some investments from fossil fuels to renewables. Then I got a paper cut while counting my money. Ooh, Mitt Romney. And then the poor schlepper on the right. My insurance premiums are rising because storms have become stronger and more frequent. At least that dangerous paper cut money is no longer around. And so... Uh, Let's talk this through. I agree with the general premise of this piece that the 1% richer people, higher income people have more resources to adapt to climate change. But the creator of this cartoon has inequality on the brain. As middle class people grow richer over time, there's greater ability to adapt to climate change. Um, real incomes continue to rise. And new products continue to arrive that make it easier to adapt to climate change. So this guy on his roof, why was his house located there? Why hadn't he moved to higher ground? Why hadn't he fortified his house with a variety of strategies to make it more climate proof? As there's more and more people in the same boat as him seeking solutions, capitalist entrepreneurs will deliver such solutions out of the profit motive, making it the case that fewer guys end up on their roof because their house didn't flood in the first place. Let's turn to the right and the guy eating a rock. So, what the cartoonist forgets in this case is that international trade and agricultural products help to protect us from climate change. It is the case that in certain regions where we've traditionally grown food that their productivity may fall. But why are those lands the only land where we can grow wheat or other crops? It could be the case that in parts of Canada will become increasingly likely to grow crops. The world is a very large surface area. In a world of international trade, International trade breaks the link between consumption and production, and we can import from those places that have a bumper crop. If uh, rainfall and if temperature shocks become more volatile, we're going to need perhaps genetically modified foods and other strategies that are more resilient and robust for growing our food supply. But if there's profit to be made from growing food, I don't think the 99%er on the right is going to end up eating a rock. Turning to the, again, it is the profit motive protecting us from climate change. And so he, this cartoonist wants to tell a fun tale of two cities, of the rich escaping the challenges created by climate change while everyone else suffering. There's a little bit of truth to this, but I think the cartoonist takes this too far in making this a relative income point versus celebrating that capitalism makes us richer, whether it's South Korea, China, Japan. United States during the 20th century of lifting people out of poverty and giving them and their governments the resources to protect themselves from new challenges. Let's do the lower left and wrap up. So we see the, the guy uh, complaining that his insurance premiums are rising. And I talk about this in my Climatopolis book, that a 
insurance companies are profit maximizers, and if the probability of severe right tail events increases, their profits would be negative if they continue to charge the old premiums under the new Mother Nature rules of the game. Of course, they're under competitive markets, they're going to try to raise their premiums. But what the cartoonist forgets in this case is product differentiation. Just as smokers get charged more for life insurance and men are charged more for car insurance than women, those who build their homes out of materials that are less, more flood and, and fire resistant due to the materials, due to where they're built, those households who, who have safer homes at lower risk will enjoy an insurance premium discount. And this provides an incentive to, to not suffer when these shocks occur because you, out of trying to reduce your insurance premium, have taken precautions. And so this cartoonist wants to make this homeowner a, a victim with no proactive strategies for protecting himself. But I predicted in Climatopolis that insurance companies are going to increasingly incentivize households to be proactive and to take ex-ante steps that mitigate the impacts when the next Hurricane Sandy takes place. So this is an important cartoon, but it's a little bit smug, and it, it wants to tell a Dickens tale of two cities, and that's overly pessimistic. And uh, the author should read Climatopolis and think about Econ 101 again.